Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closer Show. As always, Scott Carson, excited to be here with you today. Uh, today's topic is something that I've probably covered in the past in our 480 plus episodes over the last couple of years, but I thought I would share, uh, bring it back up and do a throwback uh, Wednesday, I guess you could say, or a throwback Tuesday episode, whenever you're listening to this, discussing some of the things that I've been, I've, I've honestly been on the phone talking with a lot of people getting into the note business. They're coming from uh, previous, you know, fit, buying, holding, landlords, fixing, and flipping, wholesalers. In today's episode, I wanted to talk about the seven biggest mistakes I see fix and flippers uh, getting into as far as trouble when they get into the note business. Because it's, it's a whole different ball game. And a lot of fix and flippers want to evaluate deals the same way as they've done before. And let's face it, note investing is different than fix and flipping. It's different than wholesaling. It's different than being a landlord for a variety of reasons. So I thought I would share this because I've answered these same questions or had these same discussions. I'm not joking, probably 10 to 20 times, you know, somewhere around, yeah, I know I've had it 10, more, 10 or more times in the last week alone and probably at least 20 times in the last 30 days. So I thought I would share, because I know, what, what does that tell you or what does it tell me is that a lot of people are like, hey, I have a hard time finding deals. I'm excited. I'm seeing this note business. I want to jump into it. And so I've, sh I've answered some variation of this question from, like I say, fix and flippers, wholesalers, realtors. Uh, you know, realtors are investing or trying to invest and do some things like that. And then just people with general knowledge. They've watched fix or, you know, flip this house or attended a, uh, uh, you know, a couple other things out there not necessarily a note convention or taking a class from somebody. They've just, you know, taken their weekend thing and they think they know it all because traditional investing teaches you a couple of different things. You're basing your value. You're basing your whole exit strategy on the fact that you actually own the property and having the property, either buying the property at a foreclosure auction, picking up on a subject to deal or taking the property over, or having a DD to you in a variety of ways, or buying, just buying it and, and fixing and flipping it. And that's the big first mistake, because most of the time, I actually wrote these down because I did not want to miss any of these seven, although I would probably, uh, probably remember them off the cuff. But one of the, the first big mistakes that I see people making is the whole overbidding. They're overpaying for assets. They're jacking the price up because of one simple formula gone wrong. Now, we had our buddy Chris Noggle on yesterday to talk about the previous episode talking about how if he's in a fix and flip situation, he's taking the ARV, the after repair value, times 70% minus expenses and holding costs. Okay. ARV does not exist. After repair value does not exist for the most part as a note investor, especially if you're buying occupied assets. You're overpaying. You're not going to go off of after repair value you're going off of as is value. Big difference between ARV and as is. Well, what's the difference, Scott? Well, the difference as is is exactly how the property is in its current condition, right? Not adding granite countertops, not adding an extra bedroom or bath or fix it. What is it worth exactly as it is? And this is an unfortunate thing because a lot of fix and flippers, how are they making money? They're adding value add to properties. Price lifting, as they often like to say, they'll buy a house that needs to be updated, but go in, drop money to update it, add an extra bedroom, baths, extra square footage, or tweak some things. And they have now better comps at a 4-2 versus a 3-1. Or a 3-1, or 3-2 versus a 3-1, or a 3-2 versus a 2-1 or 2-2. Okay, not a 2-2, but well, you get what I'm saying. So that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make. Now, why is that? Well, you have to go off of, if it's, especially if it's occupied, you're probably not going to get the property back immediately. It's going to take some time. That's another big thing that a lot of fix and flippers get wrong. Okay. Fix and flipping should not be your primary asset being in the note space. Now, if it's a vacant property, okay. It's a dilapidated property. Okay. But you still have to make your bid off of the as is value, not the ARV value. If it's vacant, all right, maybe you can get a deed in lieu. But if it's an estate that has a longer foreclosure process, you can't track down the borrower, you have to look at the foreclosure time frame. This is no longer, okay, this kind of brings me into my second thing. Foreclosure time frame is no longer just a 90, you know, oh, I'm gonna be in and out in 90 days. No, probably not gonna happen. 
So that's also why you have to deduct your costs down on the number one thing and overbidding, not going off of ARV times 70 minus costs. That's overbidding most of the time especially in a longer foreclosure state. You want to be lower because you're going to have more holding costs before close. And then also, what happens if the borrower reinstates? If they've got a low interest rate and they reinstate or start paying on time, what's that monthly P&I payment look as far as the ROI to you, especially if you're overpaying? So like I said, number one, number two are kind of so associated. All right. Longer time frames in number two. Number one is overbidding. ARV minus repairs is something you need to remove from your vocabulary. And I know all these six and flippers are like, oh my gosh, I can pick this up and it's going to fix and flip it. I'm like, no, there's somebody living it. You may end up reinstating. And that takes us really to number three. And this is one of the biggest mistakes I made early on, okay, is the fact is that A, trying to foreclose on anything. Foreclosure, trying to fix and flip your, should not be your primary strategy. That's actually the worst strategy you can have, all right, besides turning something into a rental. If you look at the ROIs and what we calculate, that's not saying you will end up with rentals or end up with some stuff that you may want to turn into rentals. That's fine. You just make sure you buy on the right side. If you're buying at a, a premium price, it doesn't really make sense on a good ROI, especially if you've got a, a foreclosure, then fix it up and then try to put a tenant in there. You're going to have a lower ROI compared to getting it reinstated and hold it for cash. So that's the thing. You have to reinstate. Reinstatement, starting to pay on time, should be your number one priority. And that's a mistake I made early on, trying to foreclose. I tried to foreclose everything. I came from the fix and flip side, like, oh, no, I'm not going to modify. I'm going to foreclose. I'm going to foreclose. I'm going to foreclose. Well, attorney costs, foreclosure costs, servicing costs can eat up a big chunk of your profit if you're not buying right, especially if you're buying at the 70% of ARV minus repairs. You've got foreclosure costs. You've got holding costs. We'll get to the money costs as well in a second. But that's the biggest thing. That's the number three rule is basically – like I said, you have to change your mindset. You're a lien lord, not a property lord, okay? You're not coming in to take these properties over as REOs. If you're in the note space, you should be a note investor. You're becoming the bank. So focus on that aspect when it comes to everything, okay? Now, so let's, let, one, overbidding. Two, <laughs> Uh, longer time frame than 90 day turn your money aspect of things. Now, fixing flippers, I, I meant to touch base on this on the number two thing. Fixing flippers often look at 90 day projects. Take the property down, we'll get it fixed up, rehabbed, and sold it back on the market and get it listed as, as a, on the MLS and get it sold. That's not the case. Rarely, rarely, rarely do we have deals in the note business that are going to be 90 days or less. Usually, you have to back, you know, plan on 12 months, 12 to 18 months. So, be careful. That That's, that takes us to number four, okay? Your finance costs, your money costs on note investing, especially in today's market. Many people calculate hard money numbers. And what's hard money? That's a, a loan where it's based on the, the value of the property. And they're going to lend you somewhere around 60 to 65% of ARV at 12 to 15% in a couple points. Look, that money works if you've got a fix and flip, which is quickly. That number does not work if you've got a 12-month or greater uh, deal where it can take you a while to foreclose and then a, a while to evict, then get it fixed up and then sold. So those numbers will not work because if you're into a year and you're paying basically somewhere between 15 and 18% on money costs, on payments, that's going to eat you up. Not including the fact that you're going to have foreclosure costs and other miscellaneous costs along the way. So that's the thing too. So I want you guys to focus on, yeah, your money, hard money lenders, this does not work. Now, a lot of times hard money lenders aren't going to lend on a no deal anyway. They want to be in a first lien position. And, I, and I, what's funny is I don't understand the fact that they don't understand funding note deals because they're creating paper. They're creating notes out there for everybody, right? Hard money lenders just don't have to get it. Now, it's not saying some of them don't get it and some of them will change up things, buying debt. I get that, especially if you're buying stuff at 50% on the value of as is value or less, and the numbers make sense if they get reinstated. Some lenders will do that. They're few and far between. You usually have to have a personal relationship and some sort of history with them, but hey, there you go. Um, here's another thing, okay? Here's another thing. Uh, you're not going to see the interior on a lot of times. Fix and flippers often have the hardest time with this. Now, I get it. You come from a fix and flip side. 
you've bought some crap where you've had a hole in the sheet rock. You've had toilets you've got to rip out. Well, there was some sort of science project sitting in the toilet bowl, okay? Some sort of fecal matter, okay? Some sort of an alien growing in there. I get it. We've all been there, okay? What I'm trying to get at is this is why, as a note investor, you should probably stick to owner-occupied assets or occupied assets. Now, why is that? Well, first and foremost, if you're going to go after vacant assets, yeah, you might be able to use a size you know, 13 or 14 boot hammer to get into the property, um, break a window or two. But those that are vacant will often need more repairs. That's not always likelihood that you're going to get into a vacant property. Okay, then they do need work. Now, the side or the flip side of the 180 degree angle side of this, if it's an occupied asset, you can learn a lot about the asset in the borrower by just simply doing a couple things. One, having a realtor drive by, take some photos, calling the utility department, see if the utility's on, looking at the payment history, okay? What kind of car is the borrower driving? If you're looking at the collateral file, you'll be able to see what they do as a job. Facebook stalk, or sorry, it's not stalking, Facebook sleuthing them is often a good thing, okay? So you can learn a lot about, about the bar. They have kids. Is the neighborhood nicer? Those are some important things to look at when you're looking at your occupied asset. Now, if somebody's decent and they're living in the house and the power's on and the water's on, thank God, or the sewage is more important than the water being on, what can we, what kind of conclusions can we come to? Hey, that they're probably taking care of the property, Okay. Now, it may not be like you or I would take care of the property, and there still may be some mess in the property, may have some wear and tear, but if somebody's living in the property and they decent individuals and they're mowing their yard and they're taking care of their stuff, they've got kids in a decent neighborhood, for the most part, they're probably, you know, the interior may just need some lipstick. They just need paint and carpet. This is one of the things that I love about buying occupied assets is most of the time, if we can get the bar on the phone, all right, make a right party contact in the first 30 to 60 days, oftentimes we'll get that loan reperforming at a substantial ROI to us when you annualize it out. We don't have to put in fix and flip costs. We don't have to go in and handle the foreclosure costs, okay? We can actually have somebody start paying on time, work out a solution and go from there. Now. The thing I want you guys uh, to think about here is I know a lot of people get in that aspect. They start looking at deals, okay? Start looking at the after repair value. Like they start looking like I'm going to lose 50 grand because if this person stayed in the house. Well, if you can't make a good ROI and them reinstating off of what you're paying for the note, if it's below a 10% or maybe a 12% ROI on the reinstatement, you're probably paying too much for the note. Now, the rare exception on that, I would tell you guys on that, is if it's already performing. Now, performing notes, look, I want my money to be making 12 to 15% if I'm using my own funds on a deal, right? Pretty common thing there. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to buy this deal. We're going to foreclose and make 100 grand on the deal. Well, the bar, what happens? Oh, the borrower starts making payments. Oh, it's in a longer foreclosure state, and the borrower comes to the table somehow and reinstates the loan or does a loan mod, and, you, and they have a low interest rate. Oh my gosh, a low interest rate. Like I, I'll give you an example. Just had a guy, I'm not going to name any names, but he's all over bigger pockets. I think all he does is sit him and, and read bigger pockets comments and comments there. Anyway, uh, one of his associates contacted me, had a list of performing notes. I'm like, okay, I'll look at performing notes. Well, the guy wants 95 cents in the dollar for performing notes off the UPB. Now there is a lot of equity and we'll get to equity deals in a second. But he wants 95% UPB off a weighted scale. There's like 85 assets. Only two that were like, or three or four that were like 10% interest rate loans, which that would have been eh, okay. But most of them are at 8% or 6% or below 5%. 5.21% was the average coupon rate when you blended them all together. And he wanted 95 cents of the unpaid balance on that. What does that mean I'm going to make? 5.7, 5.8% if I bought it in that way. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, there is some equity and that takes me into our next thing in a second. But if I'm not going to buy an asset that I'm not going to see at least a double digit return on. Now, if you've got low money costs, great. Okay. Low money costs are great. If you get cheap money, four or five, 6% from CDs, certificate of disappointments, or 
people that have money in a bank or a money market of fund and you're getting them three to four times to be making that, that's cheap money costs. That's a little bit different story. I mean, that's the story what banks are doing. They're getting money in, paying low interest rates and then arbitraging that. They can afford to pay, uh, to make 6% on a deal when the money costs are only costing them 1%. They're making 600% return on their money. For us as real estate investors, I want my money working hard for me. You know, if I'm going to use something in my own funds, I want to be making at least a double digit ROI. Okay. So that's one thing you keep. If I'm going to buy a note, all right, and they're paying, I'm going to take the P&I payment times 12, divide it really quickly by what I'm paying for the loan. And that's going to give me a quick number. Now that's not exactly, you want to work through your H, your financial calculator because you've got a percentage of P&I that's principal and interest. But those are numbers you want to work at. If I'm going to make less than 7%, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to get less than 10%. I'm definitely not going to waste my time. Okay. So that's the thing to keep it and look at. Making sure that your bid on a performing note is going to make sense cash flow wise. You cannot be looking at what's behind what you paid for the note. And that takes me to my next biggest thing of seven. Big, one of my, another number one, one of my seven is we see people get so excited about equity deals. And in the note business, most of the time, equity deals don't make sense. Now, let me preface this. What do I mean by equity deals? Well, let's say the borrower owes 100, I mean, the property's worth 150 as is, and they only owe 75 grand. People are like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Okay, and now a traditional fix and flipper at 70% of ARV, let's say, let's just say the ARV is 150 even with the value, okay? Well, 70% of that means you're paying somewhere around 100 if it's in good condition, less than that if it's got cost. But if the guy only owes 75 grand on a deal, you're overpaying for the asset. What happens if he reinstates and you're paying basically 75 grand? You're paying close to par because I guarantee the seller of the notes, okay, the seller of the notes is not going to sell that equity deal at something that makes sense. They're not going to give a huge discount off the unpaid balance. So that's what you see. 90, 95% of UPB, okay, with equity deals. Why do they say this? Because oftentimes, like, well, you're going to get paid off. You have to foreclose. You're going to get paid off in full. But there's all this equity you can get behind the deal. And I kind of chuckle about that. I'm like, no, I'm not going to pay 90, 95 cents of the dollar for equity deals. Because if it does start paying, I'm going to get left with a single digit interest rate, okay? You're not going to get that equity. When you buy the note and foreclose, you don't get the equity. All right, say $150,000 valued house, they owe 100, you're paying 95 grand because you can think you take it over. No, they don't pay, your maximum bid to foreclosure auction is gonna be what you're owed. That's the payments plus the UPB, late fees, and that's about it, okay? Anything it's bid at the foreclosure auction over, 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 over what you're owed does not go to you, the bank. Okay, it goes to the borrower. What's that mean? Think about this, okay? If I have a house and it's worth 150 and I only owe 100 and I sell the house and it sells for 135, does the, the, the $35,000 profit if I only owe 100, does that go to the bank? No, that would go to me. So it's the same thing in the foreclosure and a lot of realtors, a lot of investors when they come from the side or new to the note business, they're overpaying for, they're looking at, oh, it's only got $60,000 in owed and it's worth 120. Let's go ahead and buy that note. I'm like, oh, no, no, that's a very slippery and dangerous slope to be overbidding for assets, especially if it gets reinstated or if you, or have, to, if you have to foreclose. Now, let's face it. Could you give the borrower some money, cash for keys, deed and loan, take the property back? Yes, you could do that. All right. Doesn't mean could is doesn't mean it would happen. Big difference between could and would, all right? That difference in that first letter means a lot different exit strategies for it. Could versus would is, is, you know, that's why I'm like, if it's equity deals, I'm not gonna go off of the extra equity. I'm not gonna get excited. Uh, now, will I pay a little bit more than 50, 60 cents on the dollar of the UPB? Yeah, I'll pay a little bit more, but if I had to foreclose on the payoff, and that's one thing you have to look at, the payoff when there's equity deals, payoff, Hopefully the payoff is more than the property's worth for the upside down because that's what I want to focus on is upside down assets where the borrower owes more on the property than what's worth because then I can get the bigger discounts and I build in my equity with a lower purchase price on the note. Okay. 
Well, if there's a ton of equity, low ec- I mean, high equity, low UPB, the seller, hedge funds are not going to sell them at a cheaper price for the most part because they're going to get paid in full. All right. And you have to look at the difference between what you're getting paying for the note and what your payoff would be if you got paid off in full at the foreclosure auction as your profit margin. If that makes sense, great. But don't go counting your eggs or your chickens before they're hatched because you're likely not going to get that big over. If there's a tax foreclosure, the overage is going to get, you know, only what you're owed. If you're owed more, great. But if you only are owed 110 is what your total payoff is from the bar and it sells for 135, that $25,000 difference isn't going to go in you, your pocket, the banker's pocket. It's going to go back to the borrower's pocket or a second lien holder or anybody else. So that's the big thing why equity deals don't make sense on the note side for the most part. Steeper prices as far as percentage of investment to values, investment to UPB. And then also you're not going to get the over. So equity is still the borrowers until you take the property back. Okay. That's not saying we haven't paid five, 10, 15 grand to do a deed in lieu or consent to judgment to the borrower to be able to control that asset and then take that equity back. Okay. But it's a harder process because let's face it. Are, are your borrowers going to be the most sophisticated people out there? No. Where are they going to value their house? We're going to go to Zillow and type in their property. Or they're going to say, my friend and the neighbor down the street sold his house for that. Yeah, that was pristine, rehabbed, updated. Yours looks like something out of a 1970s porn disaster. Okay? Because you got the heavy shag carpet. Your white walls are not yellow with the cigarette smoke. And it's still got some weird, funky cabinets. And there is definitely a weird order, odor coming from the bathroom. Okay? They're like, oh, it's worth 150 because that's what the you know person down the street sold. No, it's not, not. You and I both know that that's not the case. But unfortunately, borrowers are going to fight for equity. If they've got some equity, they're going to fight you. They're going to drag out the foreclosure. They're going to drag out the payment plan. They're going to drag out the time frames of trying to protect. They're going to try to hire attorneys or use call their friends with a squire in their last name. Okay. Equity deals, those borrowers are going to fight you. So avoid them if you can. That's not saying you won't find them occasionally that makes sense we've got our buddy logan is working on a phenomenal he's in the first lien position he's buying his first lien at a substantial discount so he's happy paying 70 cents on the dollar for a first lien that's only at 25 percent of the full fair market value he's got a doozy of a deal he's going to make a nice chunk of change of at least 25 percent if he's able to foreclose or gets paid off one of the two all right for the bar goes refinances He's just going to get paid off that amount. So that's the thing you can keep in mind, all right? Equity deals don't make sense for the most part. You will often drag your money out longer. There are some rare exceptions. Always, always, always talk to a professional about a deal before you're making bids, okay? That takes me to the next thing, talking about the uh, changing. Most of the time, fix and flippers are overestimating repairs, okay? Now, I know our good buddy Dan Zatofsky likes to talk about, hey, I'm going to rehab the property so it lasts a while. I'm going to put in granite. I'm going to put in... Uh, tile so it lasts longer. So I don't have to repair those every year somebody moves out. I don't have to repair the carpet. Look, this is what you have to look at, everybody. If you're going to end up buying and owning a property, okay, and especially if you're buying a market below where you're living in, don't rehab the property up to your standards. Rehab the property or fix the property up to the neighborhood standards, big difference. I've seen way too many fix and flippers get into this game. They take a property back, they over rehab the property. I'm like, you're doing something in a neighborhood that makes no sense. Laminate flooring is all you gotta lay down. Quick, you know, bare paint from Home Depot. You know, don't list the property, don't expect to sell the property at 100% of value, okay? So what I always try to do is list the property, expect if I have to take a property back and have to do some work, I'm gonna list it at 80, 85 cents of the dollar off of what the true value of the property is or where the property's going and try to sell the house ever before I end up having to list it. I'll let people pick out their paint colors. I'll let them pick out their carpet. I'll often do a 10% discount if they can cl- close before I have to put in the appliances, the carpet and other things. And some people will come in and I'm like, hey, I bought this at 40 cents of uh, as is value. I'm selling it at 85% of as is value. I don't need that extra 15% and extra headaches. And then they list it and then lose it to commissions. No, it doesn't make sense. So overestimating repairs, huge, huge, huge uh, misstep by fixing and flippers getting the note business. Now, another thing here too, if you're taking a property back and it's vacant, you're going to have to replace something, at least one major system, whether it's 
the plumbing, the electrical, uh, maybe the foundation, or even the roof. Those are kind of the big, or air conditioning as well. You don't want the AC to have walked off on, or gone on vacation and walked off or the copper goblin showing up. So those are things you can keep in mind, all right? Try to double check those. Uh, it's important that you try to keep your costs down low. Look, that's why I like occupied assets. Because if a borrower is going to start paying me in time, I'll work with them so I can have a good return, good cash flow coming off what I paid so I don't have to incur any more expenses on the deals. I don't have to incur any more expenses along the way, fixing it up and then trying to sell it. When if you look at the number and the time value of money, the velocity of capital, if I can get a deal done in six months, it's twice the amount of return than I would if I was making the same return in 12 months because I can flip my money, I get my money out, money back, and then double down, all right? Hopefully that makes sense out there. So uh, I always love <clears throat> seeing what kind of questions we've got online here as we live stream this out for everybody on Facebook. Let's see where we're at. We've got some things. But that's the thing is people, I mean, let me be wrong. There's a lot more education on fix and flipping. There's a lot more glamorous uh a and &E TV or HGTV about fix and flipping. I get that. That's sexy. Woo! -hoo. That's so sexy, Scott Carson. I want to be a fix and flipper. I want to hang out at Lowe's and Home Depot. I want to get paint on my nose. I want to wear my stylish sport bra. Okay. While I'm rehabbing a property, not sweating at all. I want to sling a sledgehammer into sheetrock once or twice. Okay. Look, I'm gonna tell you something right now, everybody. You don't want to fix and flip. Trust me, your time is too valuable. I know too many fix and flippers that are working for less than minimum wage, less than minimum wage, doing rehabs when they could be doing, making a whole lot more and they're working way too hard, okay? You heard from our buddy, uh, Chris Donald talking about, he's like, oh, the fix and flip aside. If I can wholesale a deal and make three grand now, the, the time value of money, my ROI is a whole lot better than that and I don't have a lot of pain in the ass on the back end, okay? And you never want to overpay. And that's where we're seeing, and I think you've heard from him, you've heard from other experts, talking about how fix and flippers, their profits are getting squeezed because of the lack of inventory that makes sense for them. You have a lot of weekend warriors getting into the game, overpaying, over rehabbing, and that's screwing up for the people that run a real business. So you've got to evolve. Now, fix and flippers come to the note space, you're evolving. You're looking for different deals. Don't make these seven mistakes. So let's talk about this. We talked about overbidding. Okay. ARV times 70% minus costs don't, doesn't work. Equity deals don't make sense. Hard money doesn't work to finance it. You're going to have to raise private capital at rates well below the 15 to 18 percent some of you guys are paying. Longer foreclosure timeframes. Okay. Foreclosing and fixing flipping should never be your primary strategy. It should be the, the re-performance side. Uh, overestimating repairs. Oh, and then the other one we talked about, you aren't going to see the interior, okay? Now, there are some rare, rare extents, but situations where you might see the interior. If you're buying an asset the bank has sent out insurance to, and they've taken some photos, and that's in the collateral file, we've had good luck with that happening every once in a while, okay? Um, you'll also sometimes see previous listings. It was a listed short sale. You may be able to go see the interior. That's always a nice thing. We've had Nicole Espinoza on here talking about that the short sale queen and some of those workouts. You know, sometimes you'll just see a previous, previous listing, previous rehab, maybe, maybe the rent in the property, a previous trying to sell it and they took it off the property. Those are some things that are helpful for you, but you can't count on those, okay? So those are the seven biggest things that we see on a regular basis of people really screwing up in a variety of ways when it comes, <laughs> when it literally comes to you know, get in the nut space. You know, it happens all the time. You don't want to do that. It's one of those things that you do not want to do when it comes to evolving. Now, the reason, uh, you know, there's a couple of things that you, you, you want to take consideration. You're going to need some education. You're going to need to spend some time going through the different strategies. There's 10 different exit strategies in the note business, okay? It, it varies. It's going to change from time to time. Um, <laughs> I saw somebody post about there. Hey, there's no Bitcoin. There's no MLM. There's no offering to loan 5 million with a Gmail account. It's funny. Uh, 
the numbers change. If the market starts to go south, then your numbers are going to have to be even different, okay? You're going to have to be even cheaper. And I think we have to agree that the market has recovered more than it was, you know, 10, 12 years ago. I mean, pricing a decade ago was, you know, quarter, 25 cents in the dollar. I used to offer like 40 cents max of as is value in Florida a decade ago. And that was after I took 40% max. That was taking consideration when I was paying for the note plus taxes owed at 40% of as is value. And then you saw the, the increase of where it's been now. Um, now the thing is life guys is going to change and those, everybody likes to jump into the game when it seems like everybody's making money. When that's the case, you got to really pull back, pull your money back out and wait for the market to turn south. Because what's going to happen? And we're already seeing this. Our buddy Jason Bibles talked about how he's been the, the weekend warrior hard money bailout company where he's gone in and bought some debt on some hard money loans that were on fix and flips where the time just ran out. The fix and flip didn't take as good. There were weekend warriors who should not have been doing this thing in a well, okay? Uh, you have to realize it's not the same game. This is not, this is the no game, not the fix and flip game. The banks are not in the fix and flip market, okay? They didn't get this big by fix and flipping houses. They got this big by being in the note game. It's cash flow, figuring out your numbers. Yes, don't get me wrong, or will you end up fix and flipping some houses? Yes, you will. It's just going to happen, okay? I wish every deal that we bought non-performing side, they got, got re-performing. I wish every performing that we bought stayed performing, okay? You need to know some of those things, but you also want to limit your risk by what you're buying, by buying better qualified assets. Better qualified being occupied assets where you can check the payment history, you can call and see utilities on that are decent looking properties, okay? You don't wanna get in buying assets that are really, really low, $30,000 or less, even sometimes $40,000 or less, depends on the market. Now Akron, Ohio, or Gary, Indiana, you can pick up a, a nice big house for 40 grand. That's not a bad thing if it makes sense as long as you're not getting shot at. Okay, but then when you compare it to buying in like San Francisco, California, you're not going to get anything for less than a million there. Well, you know, are you going to go in there and fix it up and turn it into a million dollar, two million dollar house? Not necessarily. Our buddy Tom Beckers, uh, previous note student, previous mastermind student, he used the note business to get a list of REOs from banks and asset managers. This is a while back, not anything recently, but he got some higher end houses million dollar houses that he's able to go put in good money on those and fix those up because the market recovered, it lifted. And that's not the case these days. We're at a premium as far as pre value of assets. Look at your markets, look at what's going on in the market. If you start seeing, and this is where we're seeing the most amount of softening in the market is the higher value, the half a million dollar houses are greater. Really, I'd say anything from 350 or up or greater. Anything below that, 250 is still staying strong, but it's the higher valued assets. And that's where a lot of people get into the fix and flip side, okay? Now, if you're a builder, it's a little bit different story because if you're building at 50, 60 cents on a dollar compared to what the ARV is, that's a different story. Our buddy Curtis Warden out of Houston does a really good job with custom builds, okay? But he's building from the ground up. He's not coming and buying something, overpaying for an asset for the most part. He's asking, he's, he's buying his value by buying it cheap and his building his discounts because he's got a systems place to build, all right? So that's a big thing to keep in mind. Now, like I said, make sure you're looking at a deal. And honestly, when you have a deal, don't sit there and just run with it to the hard money lender. Don't run with it to a, a bank because the bank's not going to give you a loan. You need to be speaking to note investors. You need to be speaking to other people that have been in the, your shoes before. That's why networking at your local RIA clubs are so important or networking at meetup groups where there's a lot of investors are at is a valuable thing. Like we're going to be heading to, to Dallas here next week for the Propelio meetup where I guess they got seven, 800 investors at. Great. Looking just to meet, you know, a lot of them are fixing flippers, a lot of wholesalers. We're just going along just to network to visit with people and really just kind of say, Hey, here's an alternative. You can't find a deal in Dallas. You're tired of sending out thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, yellow letters or postcards or wasting your weekend putting out bandit signs or drawing on the bandit signs to get phone calls or then having the city zoning department stalking you with their notice department, then come on the note side. We're not doing the direct mail. We're not doing postcards. All right. We're not sure as I'm not putting out bandit signs. Our biggest thing is we want to go direct to the source. And that's one of the most 
I guess you could say that would be number eight. Okay. Big difference. Fixing flippers. Oh, we're going to have to do a lot of marketing. We're going to have to drop 35,000 postcards. You know, a while back, I, we, were, we had our buddy Jason Bible, Mr. Texas Real Estate, on talking about his bar marketing budget to find deals. And they had billboards and they were dropping $35,000 in postcards every month just to find stuff in roughly Harris County. We don't do that. All right. We're reaching out to asset managers. We're reaching out to bankers to get not one deal from an end user, but to get one list that comes on a regular basis. Okay. One list that will feed us on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis of deals, deals, deals. I mean, I'm tickled to death. Yesterday I was here in the office working on some stuff and I found another amazing thing that I'm going to share with some of my coaching students this next week about how I just found a list and some contact information of woo, some people I'm really excited about. Literally over 400 people that I'm like, oh my gosh, capital markets, secondary marketing managers. Oh, I'm salivating. Now all I've got to do is jump on LinkedIn, track those people down, send a message. Worst case, I can call their, the bank or the institution and leave a voicemail or leave an email out to people. Those are valuable things. Now they're going to have stuff on a regular basis. They're going to have stuff every quarter. Now I'm not having to fight every Tom, Dick, and Harry who's sending out postcards and yellow letters and door knocking and bandit signs and stuff like that. I don't have to do this. So that's one big thing. I said it'd be number eight thing when it comes to fixing flipping mistakes or mistakes that we see from fixing flippers is they go and do a whole lot more. They think it's the 20th century. Well, it's the 21st century down the note space. You don't have to do that. The whole idea is to work smarter, not harder. And that's what I love about notes. So once again, if you're listening to this later on, quick little recap on the seven. Don't overbid. Don't use 70% of ARV mice repairs. You'll hear that. Fix and flippers will hear that. And that's not what we do in the note business, okay? Equity deals don't make sense. Don't be buying notes and overpaying for notes where there's a ton of equity after the UPB. The seller is going to want close to UPB. And then if they do, you end up foreclosing and you're not going to get a big return. You don't get all that equity. It goes back to the borrower or junior lien holder. Okay. Hard money doesn't work. Okay. Paying 15, 18% for money doesn't work. That's too big a chunk on your note deal, especially if you've got a year long process to foreclose to get the property back. Let alone that's a big chunk of your profit right off the back. You got to be smart and work with private money and often get yourself some better deals on that. Okay. Longer time frame for the note business. It's not a, hey, I'm gonna buy a deal now and fix and flip it and have it sold in 90 days. Doesn't work that day, okay? 90 days, you'll barely have servicing transferred and be in the first month to two, first 60 days of call outs to get right party contact. That doesn't mean you can't get stuff reperforming in that time frame. We've been pretty lucky that way with some of the things that we do, but you're not gonna own the property in 90 days with a note deal. Very rarely will you do that. Some states, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, where there are fast foreclosures, Arizona, uh, Utah, uh, I know I'm missing a state right now. I'm thinking about it. Nevada. It's got some faster foreclosure rules on stuff like that, but faster foreclosure laws leads to increased price for the note. So it doesn't make sense. Always that I like six to nine months. The states would take six to nine months to foreclose. I'm often seeing the best discounts there. Okay. Foreclosing and fixing flipping should not be your primary strategy. It should be getting it reperforming. Modifications should be your first, first and number one and number two. Try to get reperforming re or do a, a loan modification trial payment plan. Those should be your top two strategies. Don't make the make, same mistake I made the first couple of years or that a lot of fix and flippers make by coming in just, oh, no, we're not going to modify. We want to take the property back, okay? Uh, you aren't going to see the interior of these assets most of the time. You realize that. That's why you want to target owner-occupied assets and do some due diligence on the property and the borrower, through either loan files, uh, Facebook sleuthing, social sleuthing, I should say, or seeing what's going on in the call logs and what's going on. Uh, with the bar, that aspect of things. And then another mistake, overestimating repairs. It's a big no-no. Look, if you can get the property back, great. Congratulations. Make sure you didn't overpay. But the biggest thing is, list. don't over-repair. Just get it in. Sell it off to somebody else. Don't try to rehab the property up to your standards. Make it up to the neighborhood standards. And you'll often save a lot of money and a lot less heartache by being smart when it comes to under rehabbing or selling the property partially rehabbed and letting the homeowners come in, get a little bit of a discount, but that 10%, 15% discount may have been a wash based on your repairs 
cost of your money, and then the time on market. And then, of course, let's not forget closing costs and commissions as well, too, on that. More you, the higher the price, the higher the commission. That's not saying, it's not saying we don't love realtors. We do love realtors. It's a big lifeblood of what we're doing, but just be smart. Once again, and then number eight, I guess you throw it in there, a lot less marketing. So once again, don't overbid. ARV is not in the note space. Equity deals don't make sense. Hard money is too expensive and doesn't work. Longer time frames. No, no to foreclose, no, okay? No interior views. Don't overestimate repairs. I guess you get number eight, less marketing. So hopefully this was valuable for you out there. Um, lots of people making mistakes. A lot of people get in the note business and they are not taking any education. They're not understanding that. They're just trying to, oh, I'm just going to buy a note and take the property back. That's not the case. And that's a recipe for failure, not a recipe for success. So take these points to heart. It's up to you whether you implement them or not. But, uh, you know, guys and gals, if you're looking for more information and want to really learn more about Note Investor, you can always check out our online education at noteblueprint.com. It's our online home study course. Take advantage of that. Uh, great, great information. Thank you to everybody uh, for all the well wishes on that and how much they love that. Got a lot of great, great case studies, people taking advantage of that and using a step-by-step train to really kind of walk you through and avoid those big hurdles or, or potholes that other people are making trying to wing it. It alone, will, the no buying blueprint will, alone will save you six months or greater in ramp up because I go and tell you exactly what you do or what you don't do. We got a whole special servicing side and foreclosures and workout, whole thing on marketing, whole thing on the basics as well too for you. So take advantage of that, noteblueprint.com. Or if you just like to get on our uh, you know, email list or text messaging list, just pull out your smartphone and pull up the text message and send me a text message. Just send the word notes, N-O-T-E-S, to the phone number 72000. So the number you're dialing is 72000, and the message is notes, N-O-T-E-S, and you'll be in our database and we'll alert you as we have new episodes, new videos, new trainings, and new classes coming uh, to a calendar near you. So go out, make something happen, everybody. Take these, to, you know, take this advice to heart, go do something, and we'll see you off the top, everybody.